Hi, everyone, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, whichever time zone you're in. Uh, and thanks for joining us today. Um, today, our panel is about automatic screening of COVID preprints and the screen IT pipeline. Uh, my name is Halil Kalucholu. I'm an associate professor at the University of Illinois School of Information Sciences, uh, and I'll be moderating the panel. To make the session more interactive and fun, uh, we'll have polls throughout the uh, talks, uh, throughout, throughout the panelist talks today. And to participate in the polls, you can use the QR code on the slide that you see right now. Uh, and, um, or you can go to the mentimeter.com uh, for the mentimeter poll um, uh, tool and enter the code uh, that, um, that you see on the slide. Uh, which we'll also post in the chat. Thanks, Rene. Uh, Rene Bernard is uh, from uh, Quest Center for Responsible uh, Research, and uh, he will be he will be helping uh, us with monitoring the uh, Mentimeter. Thank you, Rene. Do I sound okay? Okay. Somebody posted that. Okay. All right, so um, before I give the uh, floor uh, to the speakers, let me just give a quick overview of our uh, panel today. Um, so we have four speakers. Um, uh, first, our first speaker is Tracy Weisgerber from uh, Quest Center um, for Responsible Research in Berlin. And she will introduce the Automatic Screening uh, Working Group uh, project and the Screen IT Pipeline. Next up, we have Peter Ackman from University of California, San Diego. And he will talk about uh, some of the more nitty gritty details of the uh, tools and the pipeline. Um, and our third speaker is Colby Worland from Indiana University. And, uh, and um, he will discuss uh, some of the lessons that we learned from the COVID-19 preprint screening. And last but not least, we have Anita Bondrovsky from SciCrunch, um, and she will talk about how authors have responded to their preprints being screened. So without further ado, uh, I'll let uh, Tracy take the floor. Tracy. Thank you, Halil. I just need a moment to share my screen. Okay, so everyone should be seeing slides now. Um, okay, so I'm going to provide a brief introduction to what are these automated screening tools things and what kind of things can they screen for? And then I'll also give a quick overview of our automated screening working group, as well as the screen IT pipeline, which Peter will provide more details on um, after me. So our first question you might be wondering is what are automated screening tools? And automated screening tools are simply bots that are developed to detect common problems or beneficial practices in scientific publications. And that could include preprints as well as published papers. So some examples of things that automated tools might screen for include open data and open code, blinding, randomization, or power calculation, so the NIH trigger criteria, um, limitation sections, or bar graphs of continuous data, which are present potentially misleading way to present data. And there are tools for many other things as well, and P Peter will give you a complete list of the things in our pipeline in the next talk. The other thing that the tools do is they generate reports to share customized, fee customized feedback with authors, readers, editors, or reviewers. And so this information can help authors to improve their preprint or their manuscript um, before submitting it for publication, ideally. And it can also provide some information that may be helpful to readers, <clears throat> to different types of readers when they're examining a paper. What are the potential benefits of automated screening tools? Well, one of the first ones is that tools can screen many papers very quickly, and this makes them a scalable solution because we can examine a lot of papers in a very short period of time. Um, they draw authors, editors, readers, and reviewers' attention to things that can affect transparency, rigor, or reproducibility, or other aspects of good scientific practice that we would like to highlight. 
And they can also identify problematic practices. And one of the things where they may be particularly powerful is identifying problems that are widely accepted as normal within certain fields. So we all know as meta scientists that poor reporting practices or a lack of transparency about how critical methodological choices were handled are fairly common things. And unfortunately, if you, you know, wait for reviewers to flag these things, then you may be waiting for a very long time because it's unlikely that you'll be asked to change something that's a standard practice for your field. And so the tools can raise awareness by flagging some of these things and directing people to educational resources that can help them understand better practices and implement them. However, um, everything is not perfect with automated tools. The tools have significant limitations. And so I think it's important that we consider those limitations at the beginning of these sessions as well. Um, the first is performance. So tools are not perfect. Sometimes they make mistakes. And some of those mistakes can be resolved and others can't. We always work to make sure our tools have the best performance possible, but we know that they will never be perfect. Um, the next thing is that tools can't always detail whether a particular item is relevant to a particular paper. We are working on refining the pipeline to get better information on this, but as of now, a, your, the tool may screen for something that isn't in fact um, a relevant or an important item for your particular study design. And the other thing is that tools can't detect all potentially important factors. So some factors may be too complex to screen or too nuanced to develop a tool for. They may not be things that we can train a bot to detect. And then the factors for which we have or can create tools may not be the most important factors. So we will show you a number of tools that we have in Peter's talk, um, but there may be other tools or things that you would like to see. And we'll have opportunities through the Mentimeter polls for you to tell us about what things you might like to have in the pipeline a little bit later in the session. And the last reminder is that tools are not a replacement for peer review. So we really encourage readers to interpret the reports, understanding the limitations of the tools, and to recognize that the tools are designed to be interpreted by an intelligent human who is, you know, who knows more about the paper um, than the tool does. So with that in mind, um, we have developed an automated screening working group, and this was founded in January 19 with five members and three and a half tools. And the goal of the working group was to bring together scientists who have tools for creating and screening the scientific literature. So we wanted to bring together people who had tools in order to, de to develop a community of tool developers. And we hope that this might help us to facilitate collaborations, um, shared problem solving, sharing code and solutions to different issues that people are having, as well as collaborative projects that might lead to better and more complex tools. Um, and we also hope that we would be able to create an Uber tool or an improve my research button by bringing all of our tools together, because we know no one wants to go to 20 different sites to screen their paper for one thing on each site, it would be much more efficient to access all of those things in one place. And then part of the idea of this community as well is knowing when we have duplication of effort, so if we have multiple teams working on the same tool, and seeing if there are ways that they can work collaboratively in order to build a better tool or a stronger tool. We also want to know whether feedback from tools is effective in improving reporting and set standards for tool creators or for adding tools to the shared pipeline. Our group is currently around 25 to 30 members from the US, Europe, and Australia, and we are certainly welcoming additional members. So if anyone is interested, you're more than welcome to contact me. So we were working on the various networking and other things when the pandemic occurred. And many of you will know that a lot of scientists shifted their focus during the pandemic, especially in the early days, to um, focus on more pandemic-related topics when they were able to do so. And so at the time the pandemic started, about 25% of COVID publications were preprints, and many of those were posted on MedArchive. Some were also posted on BioArchive. And I'm sure we all remember that preprints were getting a lot of discussion in the press because they were some of the earliest information that was available to us about the pandemic, which was urgently needed by healthcare providers. 
However, many of you will also remember that the scientific community was very concerned about the quality of COVID-19 preprints. Um, many scientists hadn't yet embraced preprints or weren't aware that preprints existed. And this was a challenge and a discussion both for the scientific community as well as journalists and the public because these studies were being reported in the media. And Preprints are particularly interesting to us because the fact that they're not yet published means that they offer a unique opportunity to improve reporting. So if we screen published papers, the paper's already published, there's not much that the report can do or there's no opportunity for the author to react to the port, report. Whereas if we screen preprints, the authors have potentially an opportunity to make their manuscript more transparent before it's published. So our automated screening tools aren't perfect, perfect, but they allow us to intervene on a large scale, which the COVID preprint publications certainly are. And hence the automated screening working group had started working on this problem of screening COVID-19 papers or preprints early in the pandemic. Um, so in response to the pandemic, we added some additional toolmakers and tools to expand our pipeline. We pulled all of our tools into a single automated screening pipeline called Screen IT so that you could get the results all in one place. And then we began using that pipeline to screen COVID-19 preprints that were posted on BioArchive as well as MedArchive. The reports are posted publicly using the web annotation software hypothesis, and then we tweet out links to the reports via the Twitter account at SciScore Reports. And we published an early article detailing some early findings from the first year or a little bit less than a year, eight to 10 months of screening um, that was published in January of 2021. So where are we today? Well, today we've screened and posted reports on more than 18,000 COVID-19 preprints, and Colby will tell you about some of the results that we found later in the session. We have a vibrant community of toolmakers and other scientists who are interested in automated screening, and that, that community is divided into four main working groups. The pipeline group focuses on maintaining and updating the pipeline, as well as developing standards for tools to add to the pipeline. The research and applications group focuses on how we're using the tools, so exploring new applications or ways to use them for meta-research studies. The tool developers community and the statistics tool developers community are really designed to facilitate networking, collaboration, and shared problem solving. And together, we're working to improve the pipeline, develop new tools, and make more tools more accessible to scientists. So um, we have now reached our first poll question. So hopefully some of you have Menti open already, but for those who don't, you're welcome to follow the QR code here or just go to menti.com and enter the code. And there'll be a multiple choice question for, there for you. And we're interested in knowing whether you would want your paper or your preprint to be screened. So we'll give everyone a couple of minutes to answer that question. And I am going to stop sharing my screen. And Renee will share some results with us in just a minute. And if you're having trouble accessing the poll, just go ahead and post a message for us in the chat. Okay, so we have a few answers coming in so far, um, and it looks like many of you who have responded would be interested in having your paper screen. Someone definitely does not want their paper or preprint screen, and some of you are uncertain. And nobody doesn't know, so that's good. Everyone has an opinion. Okay, we'll give people just a little bit longer to enter the their answers to the poll question. And then we'll go ahead and move on to Peter's question. It looks like from, there's a there's a question from Olavo um, to everyone about the uh, sample here being a little bit biased. I think that is a fair point. I think it's uh, very likely that a sample of people watching on 
our presentation on a Saturday, as Alavo has pointed out, might be a bit biased about screening and also an audience of meta researchers furthermore. Okay. We have time maybe for a few questions. If you have questions for Tracy, now would be a good time to ask those. I'm not seeing anything yet in the QA. I think we can move on to Peter's presentation and people are more, more likely to have questions when they have more information. All right, I'll start screen sharing. Okay, can you see? Okay, so hi everyone, I'm Peter Ekman uh, at UC San Diego and I'm just gonna talk about the screen IT tools and the pipeline. So, um, each preprint that we screen is downloaded, parsed, and then analyzed by a set of tools. So SciScore is, so these are the tools in blue. Um, SciScore screens for rigor criteria defined by the NIH and the resources used in a paper like software or cell lines, and if they're identified correctly. Um, OddPub, open data detection and publications, checks for the presence of open data and code reported by the authors. Limitation Recognizer reports study limitation statements made explicitly by the authors. Um, Barzuka screens for bar graphs used for continuous data, which can be a misleading way to show continuous data. Um, Debt Fighter screens for rainbow color maps, which can be hard to, to see for colorblind readers. Trial Identifier it searches for and verifies clinical trial numbers and then reports like the title and the status of the clinical trial as well. Site reference check checks for any references with editorial notices like um, referendums or anything. Um, our transparent reports conflict of interest funding and registration statements made by the authors. And seek and blast and checks for incorrectly identified nucleotide sequences, but that's a, a semi like semi automated tool so it's not really part of the pipeline. A uh, human has to go in and, and look at it. So this is just a general overview of the pipeline here. <clears throat> so we start with the preprint data set from BioArchive and MedArchive. And from that data set, we get a list of preprint identifiers. And for each preprint, we extract the text and PDF. So both are available on, both are available on BioArchive. So with the text, we it, it's, it's like extracted from a full text HTML page. So the text is very clean, doesn't have any like other things in it. So that, that is just fed directly into, into these sets of tools that are all like text-based tools. And we also, have a, we also have a study type classifier here where the, well, like the text is used to classify whether a study is modeling or not, which can change what we actually show. And the, the pre-written identifier is also used to download a PDF. And this PDF is, is first fed directly into reference check and then the PDF is then extracted into images, which are the images are extracted out of the PDF. And then these images are fed to like the, the graph analysis tools. And the results from all these tools are then combined into one like HTML report that's posted on Hypothesis and then tweeted about on Twitter. So first I'll talk about the preprint data set. So BioArchive and MedArchive, which are the two most popular repositories of COVID-19 preprints, have a hand curated set of, of COVID-19 preprints. Um, so he, here's, here's the, the page that they have that on. And this is updated daily and it allows for programmatic access. So it's easy for us to, to get access to the, to the preprints. Um, so now I'll talk about extracting information from the preprints and the actual tools. So the tools, um, e each tool, uh, the pipeline provides these sources of input for it. So it provides an image, uh, which is images which are extracted from the PDF, um, the raw PDF file and text, which is extracted from the full text HTML page. So the tool can take any of these as input or all of them, whatever it wants. And each tool must output um, an HTML summary of its findings. So it can be displayed in the report and data for insertion into a database where we just keep track of all the preprints that we screened and all the results that we've gotten from them for a later analysis. So we also classify study types. So using the text input, we classify whether a study is a modeling study or not. Right now, we just use a support vector machine to do that. 
which is based off just like the, the frequency of, the, of words in the, in the text. So it's not a very advanced system, but it seems to work well enough for us. And we implemented this after the researchers that we talked to on Twitter told us our criteria did not apply to their preprint. So they said, oh, like, why, why, are you, why are you telling us we need these things, even though our study clearly does not deal with any of that? So we implemented after that. And, and right now, it just turns on or off the size score rigor criteria. So if it's a modeling study, the NIH rigor criteria don't apply, so we exclude them. But if it's not modeling, then we include them still. But we're currently working on expanding this classifier, and eventually we'd like to be able to like toggle certain tools based off a of specific study type classification. So if a study is of a certain type, then we want these tools because these results are still useful, but not these tools. So finally, I'll talk about the, the HTML report uh, and releasing it to the public. So we had a question about um, how can we let users know that this report exists? So BioArchive and MedArchive have a heavily moderated comment section that bots cannot use. So we tried to post through there, but they just remove them. So we decided to make results public through Twitter and Hypothesis. So the, the benefit of using Twitter is that the preprint web page displays like a tweets referencing this article sort of section where you can see all tweets that link to the article. So we can put our, our tweet there. And Hypothesis is a web annotation tool that can be used on any web page and just for us overlays the report on top of the preprint. So here's an example preprint um, and, and you can see, so, so this is on BioArchive and you can see a little Twitter icon here. So users can click on this Twitter icon and then it pulls up like an evaluation slash discussion of this paper section and our tweet is at the top here. So then users can, can click on this link here which then pulls up this, um, our, our report here. So this will just come in on the side of the, of the web page. And it has all our results. It has the you know, size score, the limitations, all that. So, and then users can then look at that side by side with the actual preprint. And if you want, uh, users can also click on the on our Twitter account and then see just all the papers we screened. So other groups actually pick up our reports as we publish them on Hypothesis and Twitter. So it's not just you know the, the people who visit BioArchive. Um, Society, which is utilized review platform and um, the home of public preprint evaluation, as they call themselves, um, publishes our evaluations on their website. So Society users can can click on our like or can click on a preprint within Society and then see our our um, report. And BioArchive will hopefully soon also display our report in the automated evaluations tab. So right now we're in this Twitter tab with a bunch of other people that they're just like talking on Twitter. Hopefully we'll get our own special little um, like place here where users can click on this just for automated evaluations. So you may wonder, how do I add my tool now? <laughs> um, we hope that our framework makes adding new tools easier so you don't have to worry about text parsing, making results public or storing them. It can just focus on the actual tool. We have a verification process right now before we include tools in our production pipeline that goes on Twitter. But you're welcome to use our code uh, for your own evaluations if you want and add your own tools to the pipeline as well. So here's the link to the to the code. And you can also contact me at this email if you want to, you know, include your tool, especially if you have performance metrics already for your tool. And we can we can talk about including them in the pipeline. So here's my Mentimeter question. <laughs> Which existing tools do you know of that you would like to add and what other or what else would you think would be useful to screen for? So you can scan this code and or visit the website here. Um, or the, the, if you're already on Mentimeter, it should update as well. Uh, so we're interested in knowing what other tools you know that might go into this pipeline and, uh, and what other types of characteristics of a, of a publication would you be interested in um, screening for? So go, out, go to menti.com and uh, give us your answer. All right, should I stop sharing? Yeah, I think we can share now. We'll take another minute until we respond.
Renette, you want to uh, share your screen? Okay, we're getting some answers. And maybe um, if you're seeing something there that you haven't thought about and you're interested in it, uh, maybe you can add that as well, just to make it bigger in the word cloud. Help us see which um, which tools are most interesting for the audience here. So we see consort criteria, stat check, um, ethics approval, plagiarized figures, data sharing. Um, we actually have data sharing uh, in the in the pipeline, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so we have data sharing. We have um conflict of interest screening and SciScore also has power calculation, even though I, that, that's one of the NIH criteria. Right. So some of these are already in the pipeline, but others are not. Fake address. Um, I'm not sure what's meant by that. That sounds interesting. There is the um, plagiarized or, or bot created paper maker. I always forget the name of it, but um, that is one of our, our consortium tools that we will potentially put into the pipeline. Um, and there is a question for, for Peter, I believe. Uh, question is, um, uh, Mario comment, it's, it's more of a comment from Mario who earlier asked uh, whether we planned for users to self screen before posting preprints. Uh, yeah, so that, that's one of the things we're, we're looking at doing. Um, we, we didn't choose to do that initially just because it was a, a public health crisis, so we wanted to just make our results public, but that's definitely something we're thinking about doing as we go forward. And Colby points out the tortured phrases paper, which um, yeah makes sense in the, in the in the case of fake addresses. All right, great. So um, our next speaker is uh, Colby, and he will talk about um, some of the results that we we got from the uh, Screen IT pipeline. Great. So let me rearrange my windows here. Hopefully I'm on the right screen. Um, all right, so thank you, Khalil. Um, so I'm gonna st start by um, continuing from what Tracy and Peter introduced, that is the COVID-19 preprint screening. Um, so as they introduced, the group has been feeding preprints from BioArchive and MedArchive through the pipeline to get a sense of how COVID-19 preprints are reporting certain items. And these preprints, as Peter explained, are from lists that BioArchive and MedArchive have hand curated as preprints that are related to COVID-19. And so we're early in our exploration of the complete data, but I will report what we have so far. And just to, to put forward right at the start here, these results are the raw results of what the algorithms identified and well, I, I'll show some early analysis with exact percentages. This precision needs to be interpreted, you know, in the context of what Tracy introduced as, as the limitations of, of these tools. So as of September 4th of this year, over 18,500 papers have been screened and you can see the, the cumulative preprints uh, published in the, the figure here on the left. On the right, you can see the number of preprints published per week that have gone through this screening pipeline. And I'll orient you to this graph briefly as you're gonna see this a lot. Um, the x-axis starts at um, on January 1st, 2020. And near the center here is December of 2020. And on the far right, we're in this month. And the x-axis reflects the count of preprints per week. So in this figure, we see preprints that have a, a statement about open data. Dark purple are preprints with open data statements and light purple uh, do not have one identified. And an example sentence that was picked up by this algorithm is on the right here. Um, it says, we have posted our data analyses at the open science framework and followed by a link. 
So overall, the, the algorithm identified that 16% of preprints have data statements, and this didn't vary too much when we look at just the first three months of the pandemic from January to March of 2020, or the most recent three months from June to September. And code sharing reflects a similar pattern. Um, here's another example on the right of a sentence that was picked up. Data in all relevant code is available on uh, GitHub, followed by the link. And here we see that overall 12% of preprints were identified with open code. And this also did not change much when comparing the first and most recent three months. So next we'll look at registration identifiers. I'll note here that this does not necessarily reflect pre-registration. It may, it may reflect registration after data collection. Um, and so this is something we haven't looked at this, this difference quite yet. Um, but an example statement, again, for you on the right is that we conducted two RCTs and then they list the clinicaltrials.gov identifiers um, with that sentence. And overall registration identifiers were flagged in 4% of preprints with a very slight bump in the most recent three months compared to the first three. And here what you could imagine that the type of studies that would be registered would tend to take more time to plan and wouldn't be published in the first few months of the pandemic. Um, yet it's interesting that we, we, you know, that difference between the, the beginning and, and more recently is still, is still small. And so here are statements identified as conflict of interest or funding statements. And you can see in the dark purple, which are the preprints that were identified as containing these are in the majority. And again, here are example sentences uh, from the screen preprints that are below each figure. On the left, the example, the authors have no competing interest to declare and on the right, this work is supported by you know, X sources. And so 98% and 92% of preprints contained conflict of interest and in funding statements respectively. And there was a jump particularly for conflict of interest statements from the first three months at 80% to the last three months uh, up to 99%. And sentences that indicate study limitations were also identified. Here is an example sentence on the right that said, uh, some limitations should be considered when interpreting the results of the systematic review. Um, so that, that's an example that would be flagged by the algorithm. <clears throat> and overall, 41% of preprints were identified to have at least one limitation st statement. And this increased from 31% in the first three months to 45% in the most recent months. So one of the tools in the pipeline screens for rainbow color maps in figures. Um, and so to give a, a very brief overview of why we and others are interested in this, um, you know, as Peter said, those who are color vision deficient are unable to process uh, much of the information in, in rainbow color map uh, schemes. And even those with typical vision, there are issues with how interpretations of figures and data change when a rainbow color scheme is used. Um, and sometimes th these interpretations change in, in misleading ways. And so um, the algorithm identified that rainbow color maps were present in 5% of preprints overall, and there was not much variation over time. Another tool in the pipeline screens for what we call problematic bar graphs. And so bar graphs per se should not be used to present continuous data because the mean and error that are shown in a plain bar graph can result from many different data distributions and other forms of showing the data are much more informative. And Tracy has a, a great paper on this and, and that in PLOS Biology and that, that reference is on the, the bottom right of the slide. So an example bar graph uh, in the middle in gray is one that is, is not ideal with the bar dot plot in orange showing a better way to reflect that data with the individual data points. Um, overall, 7% uh, of preprints were flagged with at least one you know, problematic bar graph and more informative graphics such as the bar dot plots or dot plots were observed in 
three to five percent of preprints. Uh, ethical statements are also identified, and here I show a figure on the left that reflects ethical statements in general, which include both uh, animal and human statements, and on the right is, is IRB statements, um, in other words, specific to human subjects research. And so you'll notice that these look a little wonky, um, and that's just because there's a, a change in the way that the data was stored, and I haven't yet accounted this for this in the analysis, but within these uh, two periods that we do have, we see that about 50% of papers contain an ethics statement and 33% an IRB statement. Uh, and in line with the goal to increase the study of, of sex differences in biology, uh, one algorithm looks for whether sex is reported. An example of this is shown on the right, where both males and females were included um, or were reported in this particular sentence. And we find that 11% of preprints overall address this, and this increased to 27% of preprints where an ethics statement is also detected. So next we'll look at items that are related to design rigor, that's randomization, blinding, and sample size calculations. Um, there's, a, there's a lot on this slide, so we're gonna start on the left with randomization. Uh, we see that 12% of preprints overall include a mention of randomization. Interestingly, there, there's quite a big jump from 3% in the first three months to 21% in the last three months, which you know, may reflect the change in types of study designs preprinted over time, although this, this is something we're going to have to, to look more closely at. Uh, in the middle, we have blinding, for which 3% of preprints mention some form of blinding, and this has also increased a bit over time. And finally, just 2% of preprints size calculation and this has risen in a similar way to blinding over time, 5% in the last few months. And to the bottom of each of these, you see overall estimates for each of these items when an IRB statement is also detected. And this alludes to preprints that, are, that include human subjects research. And these numbers are just a, a bit higher than the overall totals for each, 14% uh, for randomization overall, 6% for blinding, and 3% for sample size calculations. So I've, I've just thrown a whole bunch of numbers at you and you might be wondering how all these numbers relate to the broader scientific literature. Are the, the preprints better, worse, or are they about the same? And so there are a couple of previous surveys that have applied these same algorithms to the PubMed Central Open Access, open access subset and so we can make some direct comparisons from the literature overall to this set of COVID-19 preprints. And so going uh, through them one at a time, we see that for open data and registrations, um, these statements are present at about the same rate in COVID-19 preprints as the broader literature. And statements on open code are interestingly 9% higher in the preprints. The conflicts of interest in funding statements are seven to eight percent higher in preprints than the overall literature. And rather interestingly, randomization, blinding, and sample size calculations and sex as a biological variable are all quite substantially lower in COVID-19 preprints compared to the more general literature. And in fact, they reflect numbers more like what the general survey observed in 1997 and, and not more recent years. Um, and so we have a number of items yet to dig into, such as the proportion of preprints that use authenticated cell lines. But in earlier analysis, uh, you know, based on these COVID-19 preprints by the group, uh, up until July 17th of 2020, indicated that it was quite low at, at 7%. And so there will be much more to come as we, we look at these and other items more closely. So what have we learned about this process? It, one, it's feasible to use automated tools to conduct near real-time large-scale screening of preprints and provide rapid feedback to authors and readers to complement peer review. We can do you know, these 
these large scale surveys. And we have found in this case that items that reflect transparency and facilitate reproducibility are overall, overall quite poorly reported in this sample of COVID-19 preprints. And that items that reflect rigorous research designs are, are similarly overall poorly reported. And you know, finally, we want to again acknowledge that there are limitations in, in this approach as, as Tracy introduced. You know, some items are not relevant to each paper. A systematic review does not have any people randomized. Um, and so we're working on approaches to try to better tailor what is screened in each paper based on what type of paper it is. And finally, tool performance is not perfect. Some reporting criteria are easier to screen than others, but no tool reaches 100% accuracy. And we plan to continue incrementing um, and you know, trying to get to the, the best results that we can and really welcome you to join our group to help us improve this. And so at this point, I will pose a question uh, this question to the audience, and I'll leave it up for about 30 seconds, and that is, how can we make these results more useful for meta-science? There are a couple of questions, uh, but I will come back to them after the, after the poll. Yeah, maybe Rene can share the screen. The only response I'm seeing right now is tailoring. Increasing compliance, uh, that's, that's one of the goals of the, of the pipeline for sure. But also uh, from the pipeline, we're, we're generating a lot of data and, and that, might be, that might be something also, I think very useful and relevant for meta science. Yeah, it kind of looks like that was one sentence. Oh, okay. The running trials that show that this increases compliance, I think, is the uh, is is a one answer. Yeah. Um, and that's something we've been discussing uh, in the group. So um, hope we hope to we have to um, conduct a study of that, whether it does or not. Yeah, I think that was actually one of the most important things that we wanted to do when the group was founded. Um, and it just is something that got put off to the side when the pandemic hit and we decided that our time was perhaps better spent um, just pooling all our tools together and setting up a screening pipeline to run as quickly as we could. Yes. Uh, so there's a question from Olavo. Tracy, you might be in the best position to respond to this. What are the criteria to establish that a preprint has open data and code? Does it have to have a working link? Since this is OddPub, I think you- Yes. Um, OddPub does not check the link and whether it's functioning or not. It simply looks for statements that would suggest that data has been deposited or code has been deposited somewhere. Um, so it, it doesn't do any, you know, going out to other websites to check that the link is valid or that data is actually there or code is actually there or that data or code are actually useful. Um, the other thing is it's, it performs much better for data and code reposited in, deposited in repositories as opposed to data or code that are made available in the supplement of the paper. And uh, here is one place, oh, sorry. Um, and here's one you. place where we actually have two tools um, uh, that, that can shed light on this. Um, one of them is not yet incorporated into the pipeline, um, but we're working on, on that. 
And so because SciScore has uh, additionally added a, um, uh, a, another verification that does go out to the repositories and checks for those uh, IDs. But this is one of the kind of works in progress um, where we're not quite yet sure what the um, uh, uh, visualization of that is going to look like um, when we put some of the tools together. Thanks, Anita. Uh, there's a question for Colby uh, from Gabriel. Um, when analyzing the registry randomization, you somehow filtered for RCTs only in a sub analysis. Um, I think you can, you can perhaps answer this question. Yeah, so we did not filter for RCTs. So the algorithm, and Anita can comment more on this because um, this is part of the SciScore tool that picks up mentions of randomization. So it, it, it uh, picks up any mention of randomization, um, correct, Anita? It's not, you know, it's it's not necessarily uh, finding human RCTs. It's not necessarily finding, um, you know, randomization of of uh, well plates um, or things like that. Um, and so that's that's something we could we could try. There are some some automated RCT um you know filter algorithms out there that we could we could try as a first approach to to do an initial filter and then uh, and then run these algorithms on those um but yeah there's a lot of lot of things we can still we can still um uh experiment with but anita did you want to add to that um no, there's there's no real way other than looking at the paper to determine if uh, an IRB approval is also provided. So, you know, when we have the ethical IRB statement, then we presume that it's um, some kind of a human trial, uh, although it's probably not, or we don't know if it's a randomized controlled trial or not. Um, we can only pick up the fact that it has an IRB, it has randomization, um, and not necessarily that it is specifically an RCT. Um, so we don't have that classifier yet, and I don't think we have one in the group um, of tools yet either. But would you know, as Kobe said, it would be great to, to see that. Thanks, Anita. Um, there's another question from Richard uh, about authors, but I think this actually provides a nice segue into Anita's talk. So we'll come back to this question after Anita's uh, presentation. Anita? Thank you very much. And I will attempt to actually now share my screen. Okay, here we are. Okay, so um, what I, um, I wanted to take a look at is how are authors responding to this screening? And this is um, actually one of the yeah, less easy things to really quantify, but I made some attempts in this, um, in this presentation. Um, and by the way, I do have a conflict of interest disclosure. I am both a UCSD um, Department of Neuroscience um, uh, research faculty and also a SciCrunch Inc. co-founder and CEO. So. Um, that is uh, that is my conflict. Um, here is basically some user feedback, and I'm gonna um, kind of break it down into three different classes of feedback, and then I'll give you some examples. Um, so you know, the first class is thanks for checking my paper, which is really nice. We we love that class. I love that class particularly. Um, the second is the you have missed something uh, class, and I put that in kind of this middle area. And of course, the third is the uh, the red area, which, um, you know, uh, we, we can have some expletives um, uh, redacted out of this uh, out of this presentation later. OK, so by and far uh, by and, uh, and, and uh, so that the biggest uh, class of things that I have seen because I've actually been looking at the um, the Twitter feed for the last year or so is really you have missed something. So it's kind of in this middle portion. Um, and sometimes that statement is more or less negative, but it's generally um, that your tools have failed to do something that they should have uh, done. And so um, this, but this is, uh, let's look at the kind of first category and there are really two classes of these. So 
Um, there are some authors that are very concerned, and um, I put that in the heart attack category. And then I put the um, the others like these these people here with uh, with uh, with the uh, uh, without the heart attack kind of category. So generally speaking, we have um, these kind of state uh, you know questions or statements from uh, from authors who are basically saying, "Hey, re you know, rescore my paper because um, and and thanks for actually scoring it, which is nice." Um, and another one here. Um, is saying thank you very much for reviewing the article um can you give me more information so all of these are responded to um within a reasonable period of time i actually had not responded to some of the very earliest ones and uh that then i i changed that um uh, after gaining control because you know these are real authors real people real papers um, who are trying to do a good job to understand covid and the least that we can do, or at least I can do, is to respond to these. Um, so here is one recent um, uh, uh, interaction that I had from um, uh, from an author who's basically saying, "Hey, there is something. You know, there is actually an explicit limitation section, uh, which is in the manuscript. You know, and he's he's very nice. So, um, but again, this is that most prevalent category." And so I'm responding to this uh, this person here. Um, you know, thanks for setting the record straight. Sometimes AI tools don't pick up everything that they're supposed to, as anyone yelling at Alexa might experience. Uh, we will update uh, the note. Um, and so uh, here I'm also going to uh, update the tweet. So one of the things that you can see here is that the tweet, excuse me, the tweets will tell you um, that we detected three out of five rigor criteria. Um, and one resource. And in this case, there is no limitation statement. So um, different things will come into these tweets based on those reports. This is obviously very highly abbreviated um, where they would have to click on the full report to actually see the whole thing. And, um, but this author was really happy and, um, and basically, you know, told me, thank you for the response. And, you know, thank you for complimenting the paper. This actually, I did read the paper, it was very good. Um, so, uh, and then I went ahead and updated the, the report and the tweet to reflect that there is actually, is actually a limitation statement. Um, uh, here's another one. So looking at, uh, you know, another basically setting the record straight. So this author is saying that, yes, there is actually open code and here it is, which is great. Um, and then this author is saying, you know, not sure how this is generated, but it is not accurate. Uh, and here are all of the things that, you know, we actually did and did not address um, within this particular paper. So again, um, this is the most prevalent uh, kind of interaction. There are also some interactions. This is one of the first interactions that we actually had, um, which uh, was not retracted, redacted, or, or whatever, um, which is, uh, which I found kind of to be a little bit funny. Um, this is a, a researcher who uh, called us cyber bullies. And, um, you know, unsoliciting, uh, defaming bi bioinformatics studies. Uh, why would you you know, why would we randomize or use sex as a factor in uh, this metaviromic work? So then I read the paper um, that he put in, and uh, I also read uh, the the papers that provided the uh, the original data for um, for his paper. And uh, my response to this was, um, your sample looks to be uh, three affected male patients, 24, 37, and 74 years old. Um, can't find the sex of the controls in the original study, um, but why does it hurt to add demographic information into this kind of a data set? Um, and he did not respond to that. I'm not sure um, if he kind of understood that actually this might be a nice idea to, to improve the, the transparency of his manuscript. And I actually have not found out whether um, this particular study actually included um, now uh, um, a better description of the um, of the patients. Um, many of the kind of angry tweets end up being deleted <laughs> by the author. Um, uh, that you know we we believe, and I believe um, that people sort of 
react very angrily at first. Um, they might put that in public and then they think about it for a second. Um, I certainly do respond to, uh, to all of them. Um, try to respond as, as, uh, in as neutral a tone as possible. Like, thank you for, you know, uh, reporting a bug, uh, in our code. Uh, here is what I can do to, to basically fix this. And I tend to apologize. Um, but generally speaking, you know, I think people usually start to think about kind of how, what kind of, uh, uh, message they're putting out to public and then um, often remove uh, those interactions. So that has been kind of a more prevalent category of the um, how dare you, <laughs> how dare you score my paper um, kind of, you know, angry, uh, angry tweets. Um, I have also gotten one very, very long email thread. Um, and uh, you know, so we're we're definitely this is definitely not completely neutral, uh, is what I would I would say. Um, so besides these handful of um, of reactions, uh, some positive, some negative, um, is anybody actually looking at these things? So um, this is the largest uh, subset of the data that you can pull uh, reasonably um, out of Twitter, which is three months worth of in, of data. Um, uh, on their uh, analytics platform. And in the last three months, we've, you know, our tweets have been viewed 75.2 uh, thousand uh, with 72, uh, 5.2 thousand impressions over this three month period. And this is when we actually are uh, posting uh, a lot of content. And then here's when it is being viewed. Um, now I was able to pull more of this information out of um, out of these visits, and I just kind of look at it and summarize it here. Um, so one of the things that we were um, we have done is we've tweeted nineteen thousand times. So this is just over one time per article. Um, some of those are are duplicated, um, but not many. Uh, then there is uh, basically the total number of impressions as of last week was uh, over 750,000 times. So these things have been viewed a lot. Um, interestingly, um, if you look at the profile visits, so this, these are the visits to uh, you know, the, the profile on Twitter, this is more than the number of tweets. So it really does suggest that, you know, while maybe not many people are actually responding or liking or doing kind of the traditional Twitter things, they are absolutely seeing this and um, uh, interacting with the reports. Um, so there are, uh, you know, 150 mentions. So people are retweeting and tweeting uh, about our bots. And uh, we have 269 followers, which doesn't sound like much when, um, especially when you're looking at these kind of um, um, numbers for how many people are seeing the um, uh, this. And so again, uh, looking at the different uh, criteria here in terms of the number of tweets, so uh, in the blue, you have the number of tweets, and this is on a log scale so that um, some of these smaller things like, uh, you know, mentions or new followers are also able to be uh, uh, visualized on the same graph uh, as some of these bigger metrics. So um, here in June of 2020, we actually posted a lot of things all at once. Um, and this is just reflecting that we basically scored everything beforehand. And we had um, by that time understood that we couldn't post to um, bioarchive comments sections automatically. Um, and so this is when we really just turned on our pipeline, uh, scoring everything before this point. Um, and then here we basically, you know, generally we're posting at about a thousand uh, preprints per um, uh, here per month. Um, in some months, and this is just reflecting, you know, the state of the pipeline. Um, here, the, the pipeline was turned off to do some upgrades. And so we posted those, um, uh, those reports later on. Um, and so you can see that. I didn't see much of a bump, but maybe a little bit of a bump in terms of views and, um, and interactions mentions uh, after the paper came out. So the paper came out here. You can see that there are um, 
you know, there's not really a huge bump in, um, in, in uh, any of the followers or anything else. Um, but certainly it does, it does show that, you know, things are going on, people are actively looking at these things. Okay. Um, and definitely, you know, under that category, um, we also have had uh, a little bit more support from BioArchive um, staff. So uh, Richard Server uh, now comes to our meetings often and um, also has uh, recently, uh, you know, this is just a few days ago, there was a very long thread about preprints and whether they are good or bad. Um, and Richard Server is basically talking about, you know, SciScore reports and the ScreenIt pipeline and how there are already ways to um, actually start to think about the quality of, of these uh, preprint manuscripts. Um, so I think in terms of uh, entering into the consciousness of, of, our, um, of our audience, uh, I think we're starting to, to kind of get there. Um, and this is just a little contrast. There's another bot that we actually uh, have created, thanks to Peter, actually not we, Peter has created. Um, and this is just a little bot that uh, thanks, uh, it's the thank you bot for using, thank you for using our IDs bot. And uh, essentially that's all it tweets. It just says, you know, hey, we found this paper, it has our IDs, thank you for using those. Um, they improve science, uh, improve, you know, uh, transparency in science. And this one tends to be much more positive. We still haven't gotten a negative response on this particular account. So we know that uh, people will not um, necessarily discount all, um, all bots and uh, see them as negative, but they are definitely, um, when they're being thanked by bots, they're okay with them. <laughs> but when bots are telling them uh, that something is wrong with their paper, they're a little bit less um, sanguine. <laughs> or a little, a little more uh, concerned about uh, what they are saying. So um, what I wanted to now just kind of bring up on the Mentimeter, if you could go to menti.com, is to try and answer this question, right? Now that you have heard us talk and um, you, you know a little bit more about these tools, are you more like likely or less likely than before the session to want to have your paper screened? So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and yield the uh, the floor um, to my colleague with Mentimeter. Anita, could you just briefly, while people are answering the Mentimeter poll, address how many responses you might get in an average month? Because I, by, I mean, our, by far our most common response is no response, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, the, the average seems like it has been going down a little bit. Um, so the average response number is uh, kind of on the order of maybe a couple a week, it's not a huge amount. It's absolutely not a huge amount. And, and um, I, what, I, what I count as a response in that is not like liking or retweeting, it's something that I have to attend to. So mm -hmm. something has gone wrong with um, this pipeline, you have made a mistake, you know, or, or some, some such, if it's just saying, hey, you guys are doing a great job, I'm not gonna count that, <laughs> although, you know, maybe I should. Uh, Anita, there was a question from Mario. Um, I'm not sure if uh, this was entirely addressed, uh, which is that, um, do you remove tweets or you just update them? Uh, I cannot update negative? tweets. So tweets are not updatable. Once they're posted, I can remove it and put on a new tweet with the updated information. So I will just literally copy the tweet update the information and repost it. Do and you ever so completely remove it. What was that? I'm sorry. Do you ever completely remove it on on the author's request? Um, I have not. I have removed parts of the tweet. So for example, if they say this is not relevant, you know, these this score portion, you know, this part of the scoring is not relevant to my paper. I will look at the paper and I'll say, yes, that is absolutely not relevant to your paper. So therefore um, it's something that I will remove as part, as a part of the, um, 
uh, of the uh, response, the automated response, and I'll retweet it without that piece. And I'll also change the, um, the hypothesis, um, uh, uh, the hypothesis uh, um, report. Okay. Um, yeah. So there's a question from Richard, and Anita, you might uh, you might want to take this one. Uh, do you have any thoughts about how to motivate authors to take action on, on tool findings? I think this is for the entire panel. Um, I you know I really don't know um, how to better. You know, there there is this kind of naming and shaming concept, and if we say, "Oh, we can name and shame," but I'm not sure that's always the best strategy. I mean, I would have loved to have just made this a little bit more silent um, and not so public. But with the pandemic, um, I think we were fully justified in in going public, especially with preprints. Um, but I. You know, we, we have obviously all done, uh, or several of, uh, our, of the people in this group have done uh, large analyses on top of PubMed Central. And I am very hesitant to release those results uh, because I think they would, um, I mean, in aggregate, I definitely, everything has been released, but the individual ones are kind of more of the naming and shaming. And I, I don't love that strategy. I think um, we should, figure out how to encourage authors to pay more attention uh, before the paper's published. Um, and so uh, one of the things that we've, we've been doing in, Sci uh, in SciCrunch, this is on my commercial end, is we've been working with some of the society journals um, to screen uh, manuscripts before they come out as published manuscripts. And um, so, you know, our tool can be run on, um, or, or actually must be run, also within some of the publishers, um, at least once, uh, in some cases, many times uh, during the review process. And uh, recently, the American Association for Cancer Research has actually mandated that a particular score um, is necessary before they'll publish the, uh, the paper. It's not a high score, <laughs> but, but it is a score. So then I think more people are starting to pay um, a little bit more attention to that. But I don't know, um, Tracy, what do you think? So um, I think one of the things that we really want to do with this is use it as an education tool um, because many authors simply aren't aware that these things are important and they may not be commonly reported in their field. So if you look at the reports, the reports actually have links out to resources that can help authors understand why something is a problem and then how to implement better practices. Um, and we have been discussing putting together some more concrete educational materials. So things like two to three minute videos for on YouTube for each item reported or um, other more engaging formats potentially of sharing this information with authors. But we are certainly open to suggestions as to how we can engage authors more in this process. And I would encourage everyone to post. Um, I think another challenge that we have here is for some authors, they don't understand that we're doing this with every COVID preprint. And so there's a feeling of being singled out and they've never seen this before and why my paper. Um, I think if screening were more normalized and it became you know, commonly known that this is just a thing that is happening um, and these tools have limitations and you know, they're there to help, but they're not perfect. I think it might be easier for people to just um, look at the report. There was a comment in the chat about people taking it as personal criticism. And I think that that really is an issue for some people. I think some people get it and, and understand, you know, our intent um, in creating it, but it's hard to really understand that from a tweet. And so I certainly understand why people would not understand. And I think one of the things Anita has mentioned previously is that you know, when she replies, it helps people to realize that there are, there are actually humans behind these tools, um, and we're we're trying to make science better. Um, and it's not just a faceless robot that you know tweets things randomly and doesn't care what it's doing. We really are trying to make things better, but that takes time, and we're not going to be perfect from the beginning. Um, and we probably won't be perfect ever. Ever. It's just a matter of you know going through the stages to get better as quickly as we can. Thank you, Tracy. 
so before answering the other questions that are in Q and A, which are kind of more broad questions, I will um, we will do the last poll of the day, uh, which is on future directions. So you can go to um, Mentimeter and 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 give us your opinion about uh, what the future directions should be for the for this uh, for this uh, pipeline. Uh, some of these already came up um, in some ways, uh, but we'll, we're interested in knowing which one to prioritize. And I'll just raise um, Halil while people are doing this because something was mentioned in the chat about can we do a follow up study to determine whether the preprints that we screened have improved their reporting subsequently. One of the challenges there is that we have no control group. Um, we have we have screened every COVID-19 preprint. So we would have to essentially compare to non-COVID preprints, um, which is a little bit of a challenging thing for study design. Yes. So Renee, you can uh, perhaps go ahead and share the screen for pen Mentimeter. Um, and also, uh, there was another question in the chat um, about whether we consider um, uh, if we, if you consider a pilot in which we, we would see whether uh, you know we would get better responses or better compliance if you send uh, the report by email instead of publicly. Is public shaming is part of, part of the problem? Yeah, um, this is this was a pretty intense area of discussion. So what happened? One of the first tools that was developed was um, a tool that was screening bioarchive preprints. And what happened that with that tool was that it sent emails to authors and authors who liked the tool emailed the tool creator and authors who didn't emailed bioarchive um, and sent bioarchive some really unpleasant things and didn't understand that the tool wasn't part of bioarchive. It was essentially a separate thing that bioarchive had nothing to do with. Um, and so that created a lot of complications um, in our relationship with bioarchive early on and we are we would like to avoid that in the future um so i think we've we've been a little bit cautious about going to the email approach and we have been trying to work closely with bioarchive and medarchive to find an approach that works for us that works for authors and that works for them and it's a it's a very complicated um set of relationships on all sides for everyone to navigate. It's not a simple issue. Okay, so uh, our Mentimeter poll results shows that better study type specific screening is, is, the, is the top uh, choice in, in terms of future directions. And I'm happy to report that we've already, we've already started working on this uh, using um, machine learning tools to, to uh, try to identify the study types. Um, and um, and just going back to the chat, um, there are there are also um, uh, questions about um, um, let's see um, even when even when the the, the the intervention is not planned as a RCT to see whether this kind of um, automatic automated screening tools could lead to changes and that certainly something uh, in, for the future um, um, to do. Um, and let's see. So now it's time for any other questions you might have. So I'll go back to um, the Q&A. Uh, the first question we have from Richard is, is there any indication that journal editors look at the reports when evaluating preprints for publication in their journals? Uh, I'm not sure that we did any uh, follow up on that, but uh, Tracy, Anita, um, do you have any um, so we do have some heartening results from the society integration because this, uh, you know, now becomes part of uh, the the society is a platform that's put together um, by some of the eLife staff. It's uh, specifically not branded as a part of eLife because they want to make it uh, much more open. Um, and so we do know that they are picking up these things and using them. Um, I don't know 
again, we, we haven't done any specific outreach to see you know, who's using them um, as they publish uh, eLife papers and as uh, you know, those eLife papers are um, evaluated with, uh, by real peer reviewers. Um, we know, I do know of another group uh, called JMIR. Uh, it's one of the um, uh, publishers. They're looking at uh, a, a similar type of integration. They're also very interested in this kind of automated screening results um, on top of this, um, on top of the preprints. Uh, so that's another group that really wants to use the information. Um, uh, I don't know how much they have done and how much they're giving to their reviewers. Um, so uh, for, and again, for SciScore itself, uh, we do have interactions with, um, uh, with journal editors, but those are direct interactions with our tool through the backend systems. So I, I'd say we're still a little bit early and we haven't done the outreach that we need to do in order to really answer that question adequately. Anything anybody wants to add to that? Thank you, Anita. Uh, another suggestion on the chat is uh, whether we would get more understanding from the authors if BioArchive or MedArchive officially endorsed uh, the, the pipeline and they alerted during submission that the authors will get an email from us. Um, that sounds pretty reasonable. Um, um, that's been explored. As I mentioned, it's a complicated relationship. I think the important thing to remember here is that BioArchive and MedArchive have a lot of different resources and third party um, applications that are doing things with data based on papers posted on BioArchive and MedArchive. And so for them, the issue is much more complicated. Um, because it's it's hard to make decisions about you know one individual thing without having opening up a door to all of the other individual things, um, so yeah, complicated. Um, another question on Q and A by Michael Andradas. Um, he says, interesting tool going beyond the COVID nineteen papers. Do you think this tool or SciScore? is already mature to be employed in curriculum evaluation, grants distribution, and other scenarios in Scientometrics. Yeah, so I think um, it, so the SciScore tool itself, and I think, you know, all the other tools have also been screened on top of manuscripts. So if we're talking about, um, you know, curriculum evaluation, one of the things that I would, you know, stress is that Curriculum, curriculum evaluation would have to be, um, you know, looking at papers before the particular curriculum and looking at papers from those uh, students, faculty, whoever's participating in that curriculum um, after. Uh, those are not going to be fast evaluations, um, but they certainly can be done. Um, and we've, it from the SciScore side, we've definitely looked at some of that. We're looking at some um, kind of department data. We um, for our 2020 paper, um, the Minky et al, we actually looked at um, the effectiveness of the nature checklist because we knew when that was implemented. And so we've pulled out the data for that particular journal. We looked at all the different um, uh, uh, criteria that we knew were affiliated or associated with that checklist. And we saw how they changed um, before and after the checklist. And so you're welcome to see all of that. I can post um, the, the paper again. Um, it's a nice figure uh, from the, uh, in there. So yeah, I think it's, it's definitely sufficiently mature to do testing, but the testing that it's sufficiently mature to, to evaluate is only on paper. So if you're talking about evaluating grant documents, um, I, I haven't tested it on that. And we haven't done any of those kind of things, um, but certainly evaluation on papers would be uh, right up our alley. And I don't know what, I know that um, there have been other large scale trials that um, Tracy and Tracy's colleague Nico have been a part of. I think our transparent has also been run on a, a large swath of the literature, um, but not all of the tools have. Any further comments from the panel on that? 
I saw that there's a raised hand uh, by Manuel Rush. Um, I will have him to talk. Manuel? Okay, I'm not seeing that anymore. Tracy? Um, comment on the question or no i don't i i can maybe comment on a couple of things that were raised in the chat earlier because it was quite busy during talks um and so i think there was a question about whether we have done um validation studies on the tools so there are validation studies on the individual tools and I will post a link in the chat to a place where you can find that information. Um, and this discusses some of the limitations of the tool as well as giving performance criteria for evaluation studies and validation studies and provides links to those studies if they are already published and publicly available. Um, and you just need to click on the information for each tool in order to get that data. With regards to doing an assessment simply on COVID-19 preprints and whether all the tools work on that particular thing, that's something we'd like to do, but we haven't had time to as of yet. Hey. Uh, in the chat, there seems to be certainly a lot of interest in evaluating the tool uh, by involving the users and how they uh, react to the intervention uh, as an intervention uh, before and after and uh, seeing the differences. And it's not, I, I would say that's not very easy to pull off, but uh, it's certainly a very, uh, it would be a very useful thing to do. Any other questions from the audience? You can also raise your hand to speak uh, directly. Any um, sort of comments from the panel? Maybe a question. I, I don't think that the um, audience is able to unmute themselves. Um, uh, if they raise your, if they raise their hand, I can. Um, oh, then you can do it. Okay, <laughs> got it. <laughs> oh, you have special privileges. Got it. I, I now remember. Perfect. And so I have other questions. Go ahead, Tracy. Um, I was just going to say. I think. One, a couple of other things that's important to remember here, our pipeline includes both transparency tools as well as um, tools that are more screening for the quality of particular criteria. So for example, SciScore is a transparency tool. It just wants you to report things. Um, so for sex, if you say all my animals were male, you get credit for reporting that thing. Whereas OddPub, Open Data, Open Code is more about does your paper actually have open data and does it have open code and not just is there a data availability statement there? Um, and so I think it's when we think about this, we're thinking about how do the tools, how are the tools going to evolve as the needs of the community change? So as people are getting better with reporting things transparently, we will hopefully be able to implement new functions on the tool that will start to check for the quality of those statements and encourage people to implement better practices or further improve reporting. Um, I think the other thing that we've been nervous about so far is all of our um, we have avoided thus far including or thinking about tools that check for things that are misconduct um, because we don't feel that that's information that should be posted publicly. We feel that that would be much better handled through private mechanisms. And so right now, the, the group has continued to strongly feel that tools related to misconduct should not be part of the pipeline. They should be handled in a different way um, and run through a different less public and more private mechanism. Thanks, Tracy. I have a question about Peter. Peter, you said uh, that you made uh, the tool available on GitHub and, uh, and others can run it. 
but also incorporate their own tool as well? Is that is that an easy thing to do? Is there an API for it that one can uh, simply plug into? So yeah, we're um, there's, there's not like a a really easy to use API yet, even though that's something we're working on. But um, it's not too difficult if. Right now, the tools are implemented as Python methods. So the the pipeline, like the the the, the process that runs the pipeline, just calls the Python function and and it takes us, you know, any input you want. Like if you want a PDF input, text input, um, that just goes into the function. The function just returns the the results of the tool. So if if you can, if you know Python, it's it's not too difficult. But it's definitely something we're working on to improve the API to interface with different types of tools. Great, thank you. Uh, Rachel Jensen has a question on Q&A. Uh, she says, I really appreciate uh, the use of tools focused on the images, namely the one identifying rainbow color maps. Is there any other intention aimed at making papers more accessible, reducing ableism? So I would say right now, um, that is the only tool that we have in that space. We are somewhat dependent on the interests of our tool developers and our tool developer community. So if there are people working in that space that would like to join us, I would certainly encourage them to do so. Um, one of the nice things about our tool development group is that there are a lot of other tool developers. And so when you have questions or might need help or support with something, there are other people there who have experience who either have tools in the pipeline already or who are developing tools that they hope will ultimately meet criteria and be added to the pipeline that you can get advice from, that you can work with and collaborate. Um, and it's a, it's a group that I really enjoy meetings for and hearing the exchange and the conversations between people. Um, so yeah, if there are aspiring tool developers out there or people who already have stuff partially developed or made, I would really encourage them to contact us and think about joining that group. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Tracy. And one of the things that I, I found in the chat were um, a couple of questions about um, stat check and other stat validation um, questions. Uh, which I, I don't think we've really addressed yet. Um, so Kobe is, is part of the group of uh, statistical tool developers, um, actually. And uh, our transparent, uh, excuse me, um, StatCheck is definitely uh, also a part of that group of, of tools. Uh, one of the issues with, um, with statistics is that um, they're really incredibly um, complex, especially for a, um, a, a uh, set of tools like ours. Um, and stat check can be can work really well when authors report uh, in APA format. However, um, knowing uh, that there is uh, that there's a set of um, uh, uh, journal editors that have run um, stat check on non APA formatted um, uh, journals, uh, and basically, stat check came up with nothing. So, um, and the problem is that stat check expects certain things to be in certain places, um, certain kinds of numbers, degrees of freedom, and other things to be in, in a particular format. And unfortunately, not all scientists actually report in that format. And when they don't report in the format, they can't be tested with stat check. So, um, Kobe and others are looking at many other methods of pulling out information um, uh, out of papers about statistics. Um, uh, and, you know, this is just, this is going to be an ongoing set of things that I think will be added to uh, iteratively over many years because the, the problem is very, very complex. Yeah, I think another challenge there, particularly for small sample size studies, is stat checks checks for concordance between p-values, degrees of freedom, and test statistics. Um, if those things aren't being reported, stat check has nothing to check. And I'll just put a link in the chat to a paper that we published called Why We Need to Report More Than Data Were Analyzed by T-Test or ANOVA, which basically says that in small sample size studies, less than 25% of papers have exact p-values and less than 3% have the test statistics and degrees of freedom. Um, so stat check would not be useful until 
the, the quality of statistical reporting statistically improves. Or as a colleague of mine summarized, in order to check statistical reporting, there needs to be some statistical reporting going on. <laughs> yes, Thanks. thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy, for that clarification. Uh, we're at the top of the hour, so uh, we will end the uh, panel. I want to thank all the panelists for the informative presentations and all of you who joined today for your comments and uh, questions and um, further suggestions. And it certainly gave us a lot of food for thought uh, for what to do with the pipeline next. Um, so thank you and have a ni nice rest of the day um, and my nice rest of the conference. Thank you.